ETF Prime is hosted by investment advisors at the ETF Store and sponsored by Leg Mason. Leg Mason's sponsorship is not an endorsement nor a recommendation for any product or service. Leg Mason Investor Services LLC is not affiliated with the ETF Store, ETF.com, or any of its affiliates. The ETF Store is not affiliated with ETF.com or any of its affiliates. ETF.com's participation in this program should not be construed as an endorsement or an indication by ETF.com of the value of any ETF store product or service. This program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. All investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. The ETF store owns and is responsible for all program content. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Leg Mason is a leading global investment company committed to helping clients reach their financial goals through long-term actively managed strategies. Leg Mason offers a broad range of equity, fixed income, alternative, and cash strategies worldwide. It is comprised of a diverse family of specialized investment managers, each with their own independent approach to research and analysis, and has over a century of experience in identifying opportunities and delivering astute investment solutions to clients. To learn more, please visit LegMason.com. Now it's time for ETF Prime, where we discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Jason will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of ETF Prime, Nate Geraci. Great show this week. As always, I want to thank the exclusive sponsor of ETF Prime, Lake Mason. So June has already been a spectacular month for stocks. The S&P 500 is up about 7%. It closed at a new record high last week. And while we still have about a week to go, this is shaping up as the best June for the S&P since 1955. And by the way, for the year, the S&P 500 is up nearly 19%. Bonds have also performed well with interest rates coming back in. But there's actually something else catching our attention right now, and that's gold. So far in June, gold is up over 7% after being mostly flat throughout the year. Last week, gold hit its highest mark since 2013. It crossed over $1,400 an ounce. In just a moment, we'll be joined by ETF.com's Dave Nottig to take a look at gold. We're going to talk about its recent price move. And also look at the gold ETF landscape, which I think is pretty interesting. There, there are some things going on here you don't typically see in the ETF market. But, Jason, we always say gold marches to the beat of its own drummer, right? It does whatever it wants to. And so because of that, it can be difficult to know exactly what gold may be telling us here. But, but I think when you start to see gold break out like this, it's certainly worth discussing. Well, for, what, two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 years, the barbarous relic is... It's just stoked emotion and attention. It's amazing when gold moves, how, how much attention it gets. It's hard to read the tea leaves because it means different things to different people. Is it a store of value? Is it a crisis hedge? Uh, a safe haven, of course, against uh, you know monetary policies. You know, gold pays no interest, and that's what gold detractors will tell you. But right now across the planet, there's a little over $13 trillion of sovereign bonds with negative interest rates. Which is ridiculous, by the way. It, that's a farce <laughs> in itself. So gold paying no interest may be, on a relative basis, more attractive than a negative interest rate bond, which is a strange world we live in. You know, I think it's safe to say central banks are playing the role in the move of gold. Well, you know, the other story I think is interesting with gold, and we've talked about this some recently, is whether there's any sort of relationship with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Digital gold? Digital gold? Well, of course, Bitcoin is on fire right now, and there has been debate over whether Bitcoin is gold 2.0, and especially whether younger investors prefer Bitcoin to gold. So perhaps we can touch on that with Dave as well. All right. Also on the show this week will be Mike Aikens, founding partner at ETF Action, which is a brand new ETF research platform. Mike is also an ETF industry veteran. He was previously head of ETFs at Alps Advisors. So we're going to talk briefly about his platform but we're going to hit them with our rapid-fire uh, ETF q and I have a bunch of questions to throw at Mike. Uh, always a lot of fun. And then we'll close the show this week with a tremendous guest. Nancy Davis, founder of Quadratic Capital, is going to spotlight her recently launched interest rate volatility and inflation hedge ETF. 
I've got to tell you, I, I've had an opportunity to visit with Nancy in person. This is one smart, smart individual. I think you're really going to uh, enjoy this. She had a great line to Bloomberg when she launched the CTF. She said she wants to ETF the whole business. She was referring to uh, hedge funds. She said she sees ETFs as a better technology to deliver the exact same strategy to their clients. So uh, that should certainly be a fun conversation as well. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can visit ETFprime.com or you can find me on Twitter at Nate Geraci. Also, if you enjoy ETF Prime, we would greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a quick review on Apple Podcast. All right, let's talk gold with ETF.com's Dave Nottig. Time now for our weekly chat with the experts at ETF.com, the world's leading independent authority on ETF. People have been saying there are too many mutual funds since the 80s. For all the talk of smart beta, they haven't pulled in huge assets. The active managers are showing up in the ETF space. Dave, so as I mentioned at the top, gold has started to break out. Uh, it's up, what, 7 8% so far in June. It was basically flat for the year prior to that, uh, maybe up a percent or two. And look, we know gold likes to do its own thing, right? There's not always a, <laughs> a strong rationale for why gold is doing what it's doing. But as you look at the price of gold recently, what do you think are some potential drivers here? Do you think this is primarily Fed-driven? Yeah, I think there are a couple things. You know, I think uh, one of the things that I love about following gold is that it is such a pure commodity, right? It is just supply and demand. That's It really just comes down to the core. Um, and luckily, it's relatively easy to figure out supply and demand in the gold market. You can go to gold.org or any number of sites that, that track with minute detail every single mine's production, every single Indian wedding, uh, you know, all the major drivers. And, you know, we've kind of had a perfect storm. Um, you guys mentioned at the top we have seen central bank buying at a level we have not seen really in about six years, um, Russia, China. Um, sort of most of the non-Western economies uh, building up their reserves, that has a huge impact on what is otherwise a fairly flat market in terms of supply and demand. We saw really strong first quarter buying from India. That's that's a traditional season for gift giving, and that, that may not sound like a lot, but we're talking about, you know, 125 tons. It's a lot of gold that gets exchanged in sort of the Indian wedding season in the first quarter. All those things are really hitting at the same time. And so we've got this sort of increased exogenous demand for the metal itself. Uh, you put on top of that the, the global concerns I think people have. Obviously, anytime we have big tensions in the Middle East, anytime we have the prospect of a falling dollar, all those things are kind of a perfect storm for gold right now. So it's not surprising to see that it's up. I think the real question is, is this sustainable? Uh, or was this sort of a spike coming out of the first quarter uh, and into the second quarter? Was this a spike in demand? And now, you know, we see ETF buyers starting to come in. It had been a terrible year for ETF gold flows. That's really turned around in the last couple of weeks. I worry a little bit this may be folks getting out after the barn doors closed. Dave, if we could drill down just a bit further, uh, maybe do a little gold in Economics 101. Why is it if the dollar falls that gold tends to rise? Sure. So, you know, any commodity that is predominantly traded in the U.S. dollar um, will, you know, from the U.S. investor's perspective, as the dollar weakens, you need more dollars to get a unit of that commodity. So, uh, you know, if the dollar fell 20 percent in value, you know, across the global stage, you would expect the price of gold, the price of oil, the price of corn to all be up 20 percent, right? You would see that value go up because your dollar is now weaker. It doesn't have the same purchasing power it had before. Now, obviously, everything is not equal, and, and, and that's just one of the many factors that play into both the dollar and into the price of commodities. But as a predominantly dollar-traded commodity, weak dollar means strong gold. And conversely, a bullish, you know, go, go, go dollar tends to be poor for the price of gold from a U.S. investor's perspective. But what that's about... Well, I was going to say, what about interest rates in particular? So, you know, if we talk about potentially more dovish Fed, can you explain this concept of opportunity cost when it comes to gold and interest rates, right? That, that lower rates can be beneficial to gold. Yeah, so that's the flip side, right? So lower rates tend to be bad for the dollar, which tends to be good for the price of gold.
gold in that sense. Um, but the other thing is, if you think about gold as a safe haven asset from an investor's perspective, not necessarily from the central bank's perspective or a, you know a, a jewelry purchaser's perspective, just as a raw investment perspective, you always have to be thinking about what else could I be doing with that investable dollar. Um, and if you are worried about risky assets, whether it's real estate or the stock market, and you want to put your money in something quote unquote safer, what do you do? Well. You can put it in your mattress. You can buy short-term securities. You can buy long-term treasuries or mid-term treasuries. You can buy gold. You could buy Bitcoin. All of these things get held out as sort of safe havens in which to park your cash. So if there's really no attraction in the global bond market, which with most real rates negative around the world except in the U.S., it's, it's, you literally have a negative incentive to hold short-term paper, uh, then gold starts looking like a reasonably attractive place to put your money, especially if you think we're in a falling interest rate environment. All right, let's talk more about uh, being worried about risky assets. And I feel like I've been asking you this a lot recently when, when we talk oil or bonds or whatever. But is it possible gold is a, a canary in the coal mine right now? Does the price of gold starting to move here make you nervous at all in terms of the stock market or economy? Um, not so much. I, I you know, certainly much smarter academics than me have written long papers about the relationship between gold and other asset classes. My my experience, my read of it is that gold tends to be a bit of a lagging indicator, not a leading one. So I actually see the the sort of rise in gold prices over the last few months as actually sort of the tail end of what we saw coming out of the fourth quarter of last year. Um, so when you look at things like central bank buying, well, that doesn't happen in a in a, in an instant, right? They don't just reverse course and say, ah, you know what, we want 100 tons more in the, in the vault downstairs. There has to be a process put in place. That money has to come from somewhere. Those trades are negotiated. They're not just done on the open market. Um, so, so, you know, any panic that, say, Russia and China were feeling in, in December takes, in my experience, a quarter to show up in the actual price and movement of gold. So I tend to think of it as a bit of a lagging indicator. Um, I, I haven't seen anything yet that's making me feel like, holy cow, everybody's running for the exits. You know, we just turned the corner on positive gold flows uh, in the ETF space here in the U.S. really in the last couple of days. I mean, if it wasn't for a billion-dollar creation that GLD had, uh, I think it was Monday this week, um, then, then it would be negative for the year. So we haven't actually seen a huge influx of sort of ETF investor money. Dave Jason here. From a portfolio construction standpoint, many advisors and investors at some point recommend a core holding to gold at, at you know small levels, large levels, whatever. Now, we don't give individual investment advice, but how should investors think about this price, uh, the price move of, of gold lately? Is there, do we attempt to time the market and make tactical trading decisions to take advantage of this? Do we let the simple quarterly, semi-annual, annual rebalance process, take care of that on its own, buy low, sell high. How should investors think about this? Well, you know, I think one of the interesting things about gold, certainly from a tactical perspective, is unlike other asset classes, there is no inherent value. And I don't mean that to say nobody should own gold. What I mean is I can't get a piece of paper out and and prove to you that there is some baseline value to an ounce of gold. I can do that for Apple stock, right? We can, even if we have wildly different opinions about Apple's prospects, we can sit down and, and add up their factories and their inventory and their cash, and we can come up with something like a book value. You can't do that for gold. What that means is if you are going to be a speculator in this and you're going to try to be tactical and time your way in and out of a position, you are playing a pure psychological trading game with the rest of the market. Um, you, you, are, you are making a bet, if you are a buyer right now, that there are buyers in the future who have yet to panic and buy gold or who have yet to rebalance into their gold position for the quarter, and you are going to profit from that. Um, and that's, a, that's certainly a viable trading strategy, but it is very speculative. I would argue it's more speculative than trading FANG stocks. Um, so, it, you know, I think the other way of thinking about it, as you pointed out, that sort of common recommendation of a core you know, whatever, 3 5 10% holding in gold, my opinion is you're better off, if that's part of your portfolio, let your regular rebalances handle that. Let your dollar cost averaging handle that. Don't try to get cute and time it. Our guest is ETF.com's Dave Nottig. Dave, let's move on and, and talk physical gold ETFs. Uh, 
And first, let me quickly run through the options here. There are seven in all. And then I have some other uh, questions or observations I'd love your take on. So the largest and most expensive physical gold ETF is the Spider Gold shares, GLD. That's 40 basis points. There's the Spider Gold mini shares, ticker GLDM, 18 basis points. Uh, iShares Gold Trust, ticker IU, that's at 25 basis points. The Granite Shares Gold Trust, ticker BAR, that's it. This is great. 17.49 basis points. Uh, the Aberdeen Standard Physical Swiss Gold Shares, SGOL, 17 basis points. The Perth Mint Physical Gold ETF, 18 basis points. And then the Van Eck Merck Gold ETF, ticker OUNZ, O-U-N-Z, 40 basis points. You know, as I look at the physical gold ETF landscape, one of the things that has really stood out to me is that GLDM, BAR, and AAAU – They've all launched in the past two years, and actually GLDM and AAAU last year. Combined, these three ETFs have like $1.5 billion invested, which I just find remarkable, right? Because you think about the competition that already exists in the space. When, When you look at GLD and IU, the question is, why do you think these new gold ETFs have found some success? Is this all price driven? I, I think it's 100 percent price driven. Um, you know, when Granite Chart put put BAR out there at their, you know, hundredth of a basis point fractional fee, <laughs> uh, which we all got a good chuckle out of it. Um, you know, we we all sat here and thought Will Ryan from Granite Shares might be crazy, but the reality is he's crazy like a fox, right? He understood that particularly in this space where people are making these psychological investments, cost was going to matter. And we knew this because, you know, years and years ago, IAU cut its fee from 40 basis points to 25, undercutting GLD by 15 basis points. And lo and behold, the floodgates opened and billions of dollars transferred over the course of a year or two into IAU, making it what now what, a $13 billion powerhouse fund. Um, it, it, he basically counted on the fact that he'd be able to do that again, right? That he'd be able to out IAU, IAU. And in fact, that's exactly what he did. Now, he has competition down there at the, the low end of the fee space, um, you know, from, from GLDM, I think, in particular, which brings with it the sort of GLD brand name along for the ride. Uh, but the reality is they're, they're all pulling in the money because fundamentally this is not rocket science, right? There really is no investment difference between any of these funds. They all warehouse gold in certified vaults. It's all audited, et cetera. If you're a true gold bug, sure, something like SGOL, which just chooses a different place to put the gold in a vault, I suppose, is a is a difference, but it doesn't affect your performance unless there's Armageddon and you're trying to figure out how to get to the vault. All right, briefly here, besides the physical gold ETFs, investors can also look at the gold mining ETFs, right? Something like the Vanek Vectors Gold Miners ETF, GDX yep. or GDXJ, the Junior Gold Miners. Any uh, quick thoughts on investing in these? Yeah, so I, I, this is a really... A, historical issue, right? People, it used to be very difficult to own a large amount of physical gold because you had to own it in specie. You had to actually go get physical possession of it or pay somebody for that. And so for decades, people used miners effectively as a proxy for gold. And the gold miners knew this, and they actually managed their own futures books to, to make their stock prices more tied to the price of gold because that's why people invested in their stock. That's really changed. Um, And so now when you think about gold miners, I think it's really important to think I am investing in a bunch of natural resource companies who pull stuff out of the ground. None of these companies are true pure plays. They're all really in the mining and exploration business and the marketing and refining business. Um, And gold happens to be one of the major things that they do, and it's often the most important thing that they do. But they're also pulling out platinum and copper and all sorts of other stuff. And you're investing in this sort of industrials and basic materials business. Um, And that comes with pros and cons, right? The pros are they tend to be a little bit more stable than the price of gold when gold's getting whipsawed. But you're getting single stock risk in each one of these companies. Uh, And these portfolios are pretty concentrated in a handful of names. So I I would there's nothing wrong with these funds, but recognize what you're doing is making a basic materials equity allocation, not a gold allocation. Dave, about two minutes left. I have to end this week with a question you probably knew was coming, but I I just can't help myself. I have to ask you about gold versus Bitcoin. Uh, So, so look, you talk to all sorts of investors. You talk to individual investors, RIAs, institutional investors. Certainly, you're you're in, in close communication with ETF and fund providers. 
I'm just curious, what are some things you hear on Bitcoin and uh, whether it's potentially a longer term threat to gold? Well, certainly there are plenty of Bitcoin boosters out there who will happily drag up the phrase digital gold, right? That And Bitcoin has been marketed to the investment community as digital gold from, I think, the very first things I read about it years ago. Uh, and, and there's some truth to that in the sense that it is uh, a commodity of psychology, much like gold, and uh, in in doesn't have any inherent worth. It's not backed by something that is also demonstrably worth something. So I think those are apt comparisons. The big difference is, by comparison, the Bitcoin market is minuscule with a handful of players, and that means that its price is going to be swung far more by the actions of a handful of big players uh, than anything else. And also because those players are inherently anonymous, uh, we don't really know who's doing what. Versus in the gold market, we can often we can often chase things down and see who's cornering a market or who's trying to manipulate the London fix. Or you can you can identify participants in the market when you see big swings. You can't in, in Bitcoin. I mean, I saw going across the Bitcoin trade tape something like a seven hundred million dollar trade uh, that just got printed. Nobody had any idea. Nobody has any idea who bought it. Nobody has any idea who sold it. That's an amazing amount of money to move through something that, again, has no inherent value or traditional marketplace. So I think we're a long way from thinking of it as a safe, stable store of value, the way a lot of people think about gold. Uh, But I think long term, there's no question something like Bitcoin could be the digital gold people are looking for. Well, and I have to mention, you have a piece out today at ETF.com titled The Most Interesting ETF Filing Ever. Libra, uh, obviously referencing Facebook's Libra coin that was announced last week. Um, I highly recommend taking a look at this. This was just a fascinating read on how Libra is potentially, it, it looks a lot like an ETF. Uh, it, it, I think you call it CEW, the Wisdom Tree Currency ETF, uh, in sheep's clothing. But you talk a lot about the broader implications. And I should mention, uh, you and I are hoping to go much more in depth on that on July 9th. We'll also be joining that show uh, by Matt Hogan and then Tyrone Ross. So it should, should be a great show on crypto. Just wanted to mention that. Dave, excellent insight as always. Uh, we'll chat again next week. Great. Thanks for having me. That was ETF.com's Dave Nottig. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll be joined by ETF Action's Mike Akins. His firm is rolling out a brand-new ETF research platform, and Mike is also an ETF industry veteran. So we'll talk about that platform, and then I'm going to hit Mike with our rapid-fire ETF Q&A. should be a lot of fun. You're listening to ETF Prime. Our next guest is Mike Akins, founding partner at ETF Action, which is a brand new ETF research platform that Mike is helping to build out. They offer all sorts of tools, particularly to financial advisors, with a goal being to help them better research and evaluate ETFs and even the broader financial markets. Interestingly, prior to founding ETF Action, Mike was the head of ETFs at Alps Advisors, where he oversaw all aspects of some $15 billion in ETFs. Uh, He was there for over 10 years. So Mike certainly qualifies as an ETF industry veteran, and he's now joining us via phone from Denver. Mike, great having you on the show this week. That's great to be here, Nate. Thanks for having me. Mike, let's start with ETF action, and then uh, we're going to have some fun this week. I have a whole laundry list of ETF topics that we can dive into. Uh, But first, tell us more about uh, your background and why you decided to launch ETF action. Sure, you bet. Uh, ETF Action is a technology and research firm uh, with the singular goal of simplifying the ETF screening, research, and selection process. You think about kind of why we decided to launch it. Um, there's now 2,200 plus ETFs tracking over, you know, 100,000 different stocks and bonds. The, the process is very daunting, but the capabilities are endless. So we wanted to create something that allowed users a comprehensive process for evaluating, finding, navigating, and researching ETFs with the goal of building customized portfolios for their clients. Um, you know, I think it's interesting with the with ETF Action, we really break our model into three main categories. We offer up at one flat subscription rate, 
And the idea being is there's a process to any investment process, no matter what, whether you're doing single security selection, mutual fund evaluation, or ETFs, and it really starts with infrastructure. Um, in order to properly align ETFs, et cetera, you have to have the infrastructure to find and quickly evaluate strategies. That's really what we started with with ETF Action. Um, we have a very robust data set procured from best-in-class providers um, that allows folks to break down ETFs at different levels, basically being structural data, the type of ETF, expense ratio, as well as descriptive data, category, investment objective, um, investment methodology, um, links to sponsors, to index providers where you can really get into the nuts and bolts of the strategy. And then, most importantly, um, constituent data. Uh, I think that a lot of people are trying to rewrite the how to evaluate and do investment through ETFs. And the reality is ETFs are just tools, and some tools are really good for what you're trying to achieve, and some aren't. But they're just baskets of securities, and we don't think we should be re reinventing the wheel to evaluate them, but we should have the tools and the functionality to aggregate um, the proper composition data, fundamental data, technical data, to allow users to easily find strategies that align with their um, goals, with their client needs, um, and with their market assumptions. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of step one of our whole process um, is to provide that infrastructure, and then we provide with it um, a lead-by-example research platform where we utilize our tools, our infrastructure, to create um, ongoing research across segments, categories, opportunities, and then we end with the ability to um, follow model templates that we've built out that allow, you know, that again, lead by example to show folks how they might create a sector and industry strategy, how, the, how they might create a factor strategy, create that template to utilize our software as a service. Mike, I was poking around the uh, ETF Action website, and I saw that you provide what, what I thought was a really comprehensive daily note. This included a market overview. There's some economic data. You highlight ETF performance. There are some ETF charts as well. Is this always available for free? Because I didn't need a, a, a login to access this. Yeah, that's right. So we do a, our daily note is, is free. Um, it's a limited version of what we provide to subscribers. But the idea is we wanted to show how ETFs can be used to perform market research. Um, on, honestly, at this point in time, with the number of ETFs out there, the vast majority of a portfolio can be built utilizing these super transparent, liquid, nearly free um, tools. And we wanted to show folks how, you know, through commentary, they can see on a regular basis how to think about using ETFs across those different segments. All right. So if people are interested in checking out the Daily Note or they're interested in exploring the uh, the research platform, I assume just go to ETFaction.com. Is there a, a free trial available? There is. There's a free trial. Um, right now, you do have to put your credit card in. Um, we're going to do a new release at the end of July of our entire website um, that's going to inv involve a bunch of more visualization and functionality for downloading, et cetera. And at that point in time, we're going to um, do away with our early adopter special and allow for free trials without um, using a credit card. But, yeah, they can sign up for the Daily Note. It's a great way to stay on top of what we're doing right there on the website, and it's free. It's one simple. We don't hit you with a bunch of, um, you know, emails. It's just one simple daily note um, each day at um, 6 Eastern, 4 Mountain Time here in Denver. Our guest is Mike Akins, founding partner of ETF Action. Mike, let's move on to our uh, rapid-fire ETF Q&A. So I have a bunch of different ETF topics we can cover here. We'll see how many we can get to. And perhaps we can start by discussing a few of the broader trends we're seeing in the ETF space. Um, clearly, there continues to be a flood of money into iShares and Vanguard ETFs, right? There's still this intense focus on ETF fees by investors. Do you have any concerns here, or does this all make sense to you? And I just feel like maybe you might have a, uh, a unique perspective, given that you were at a smaller ETF provider, right? You're trying to compete with these larger players. Is there too much focus on cost, and are you concerned with iShares and Vanguard dominating flows? Uh Short answer is no, um, but clearly it's a bit of a conundrum. Um, I, I think it's very similar to the discussion happening in big tech right now. Um, you have a situation where it is very competitive market because of what technology is, is disrupting. It's creating, but it's creating a better environment for the consumer, for the end investor, right? So the low cost is a good thing. 
um, access is a good thing. So I, I think if you really think about it, ultimately ETFs are just tools, and so long as they're a wide variety of strategies, market forces will keep things in balance. And what I mean by wide variety is, you know, just because if I'm SSGA and I dominate the sector market, as long as investors aren't all buying the XLU, the utilities, and they're making their own market assumptions, then we have a balanced market where I think a concern with ETFs, a bigger concern would be the idea of everybody just owning one specific product that would create all kinds of issues. But I don't, I don't see that occurring. And I think, Look, if you build the right strategy at the right cost, people will come. Um, but it's a tough game, and you have to know that the big three or the big four are going to come after you if you build the right strategy. So you need to get there first, and you need to be prepared to defend your, your market share with fee cutting. So let's play this out. What do you think happens longer term? Well, let's say iShares and Vanguard continue dominating and growing market share. Do you think there's a possibility that the government would ever step in at some point? And, and you were alluding to this. You know, it's odd because this isn't a situation where you have a few players dominating and raising prices, right? Instead, you have investor costs coming down. You, you said, you know, it's creating a better environment for the consumer. So is there even the rationale for the government to get involved? I think the only thing that's big picture concerning would be if ETFs, and we're nowhere near this point, um, ETFs in the traditional passive sense. So I'm not talking factor-based strategies or niche market segment strategies, but the Vanguard approach of market capitalization investing, there will be an inflection point with respect to too much money being passive, but we're nowhere near that if you look at um, average ownership of securities in a passive vehicle versus active. At some point, the pendulum always swings too far, I just don't think we're we're near that at right now. And at that point, the regulators would have to be very concerned about proxy voting, um, governance of companies, because the ownership is so passive. All right. So to your point, one of the reasons iShares and Vanguard are raking in so much cash right now is investors are continuing to gav- uh, gravitate towards passive investing, index-based investing. But as I'm sure you're aware, uh, recently the SEC approved a non-transparent ETF structure. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's called active shares. So it functions very similar to a traditional ETF, but fund managers won't have to disclose their holdings on a daily basis. Do you, do you think that could potentially shift the tide for active managers just by lowering the fee and, and lowering the tax hurdle, which you know theoretically would then give them a better shot at generating some outperformance? Yeah, I think implemented properly, it's fantastic. Um, it should have been, in my opinion, approved five, six years ago. But there's a couple of big caveats, and it falls on the sponsors and the market makers to get it right. And that's really number one, spreads and trade execution. Um, You know, low cost is great, but you have to think about low cost from a totality picture, um, transaction costs included. So they have to get it right, and they have to do right by the users of these strategies. And then I think the other bigger the bigger thing probably is this idea that if an active manager wants to be successful. And using an ETF, they need to embrace what's made ETFs so great, and that's their empowering portfolio construction tool. So essentially, if active managers come out and they want to create a one-size-fits-all, buy our strategy, you've got your equities taken care of, buy our fixed income, you've got our – that's one of the things that's made ETFs so great is that people are allowed to implement their own needs and uh, market assumptions through ETFs. So if – if active management comes in and says, hey, I can do cybersecurity better, or I can do technology better, or I can do um, quality better than a simple rules-based strategy, I think they'll be successful. If they come in and say, you know, here's our core um, ETF strategy, I, I think it's going to be overwhelmingly difficult, assuming a higher expense ratio, to add value, and they'll struggle, just like those big mutual funds are struggling outside of the 401k market, and that's just because it's captive. Our guest is Mike Akins, founding partner of ETF Action. Mike, switching gear, something you actually mentioned to me offline a few weeks ago, which I thought was really interesting, is this idea that ETFs have become excellent market research tools, not just excellent investment tools. Do you want to explain what you mean by that? Absolutely. So this is really what gets me geeked up and um, got me got myself and my partners excited about ETF action. Um, the reality is single security research, while extremely important, 
is also extremely noisy. Um, there's thousands of variables that need to be assessed when, a, when looking at a company, and that needs to be assessed at some point, but not out of the gate. And I think if you just take a step back and think about index proliferation and the licensing of those indexes started at the institutional level to enhance research capabilities, right? The reason those indexes started coming out from S&P and MSCI is because institutions were demanding, hey, provide me something that I can bucket the market into various segments. Well, with the evolution of the ETF, and you basically, by rule, ETF being transparent, now with the right technology, you can take ever-growing segments of the market and strategies, call it equal weight versus market cap or retail companies versus online companies, and you can look at those at a broad brush. So the, the use cases are endless, but a couple of examples I think of, you know, security selection. Let's... And if I'm going, if I was an active manager, and if we implement and our vision properly at ETF Action, I anticipate several active managers utilizing our platform because if I want to identify areas that are attractive for me to invest in, there's no better way than to identify my favorite ETFs tracking that space. So, you know, there's a lot of work that would go into finding 50 companies that are quote unquote cybersecurity or online retail companies. ETF providers have done the work for you. Now you have the shell to start looking at those companies. It really expedites that process. But then it goes on to another great example would be earnings, revenues, and trends by segment. You know, so looking at how many um, earnings beats and misses there are by an ever-growing segment. So I always like to use retail and versus online. But if you look at percentage of companies that beat for for an ETF like iBuy or ONLN, um, the online retail ETF versus something more traditional like XRT, you see extreme um, examples of trends playing out that had you used that bottom-up analysis of aggregating those securities early on, those trends would have become, you know, present an opportunity to, to differentiate your portfolio. Um, technical indicators is another great example. Um, people look at breadth of market, moving averages, of the underlying constituents of broad-based indexes, it's just as powerful, if not more powerful, at the individual level. And the reason the ETF is such a great research tool is it's, other than the constituent data, it's free. To license 2,200 indexes is would be a staggering dollar amount to go out and negotiate those licensing fees. But ETFs, by rule, track those indexes perfectly. They are those indexes. And it provides this opportunity to really um, complement your research efforts and simplify the research process. Well, you know, when you first mentioned this concept to me, um, I immediately thought of Bloomberg's Eric Balchunas. So I don't know if you've seen this, but he's come out with a basket of ETFs representing traders, so the so-called smart money. And, you know, he has heavily traded ETFs like SPY and, and the Qs in there. And then he has another basket of ETFs representing longer-term investors, so the allocators, more the retail side. That includes something like VOO. And the idea here is to look at flows to track how these two groups are reacting to the market, which then theoretically could provide a nice snapshot of market sentiment. I just thought that was a pretty good example of what you're talking about. Mike, we only have a a couple of minutes left here. Uh, I want to close with a few questions that I like to ask everyone. So we're going to have to go quick here. Uh, First, Bitcoin ETF, yes or no? Should there be one? Yes, demand is there, and it's a better mousetrap than the Bitcoin trust, which is trading at 100% premium to NAF. Agreed. Besides a Bitcoin ETF, is there an ETF that doesn't currently exist that you would like to see? I wouldn't say one specific um, ETF, but I do. I would like to see more rebalance optimization in ETF. Um, I'd like to see that expanded. And what I mean is like the idea of blind rebalancing, um, randomized rebalancing. I think there's an opportunity set there to make, to make the ETF structure even better by creating ETFs that um, – allow some sort of defenses against um, market activity. All right, your favorite under-the-radar ETF. And to be clear, this is not an investment recommendation, just an ETF. Uh, you think doesn't necessarily get the attention it deserves? I would do a, a series, so the Spider Kencho series. Um, it's a, cheating a little bit, but they've got six um, thematic strategies now that have only gathered less than $100 million in total across the six strategies. Very low cost for theme-based strategies and very interesting um, 
topics. All right, your favorite ETF ticker symbol? This is a no-brainer for me. UFO, Procure Space ETF, follows the S-Network Space Index. That's a good one. Uh, and then lastly, what has you most excited for the future of ETFs? Uh, I think direct indexing, through basically pro- proliferating ETF strategists, um, which I think will be mostly a good thing. But I think direct indexing gets at this whole idea that it's going to be disrupting ETFs. I don't see that. The reality is it's way too expensive, way too complicated. But I do think direct indexing using ETF models will expand the ability for ETF strategists to come to market, providing um, more and more options to create customized portfolios using the superior um, structure of the ETF. Well, Mike, this was a lot of fun. Congratulations on the rollout of ETF Action. We'll we'll have to touch base later this year to see how everything is uh, going, but certainly wish you all the best. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Nate. Thanks for having me. Really enjoyed it. That was Mike Aikens, founding partner of ETF Action. When we come back from break, I'm really excited about our next guest. We'll be joined by Quadratic Capital's Nancy Davis. We're going to spotlight her brand new ETF. And Nancy is on record as saying she wants to ETF the entire hedge fund space. So we'll have her explain right after the break. You're listening to ETF Prime. Welcome back to ETF Prime. Let's go right to our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight, where each week we highlight one exchange-traded fund. There are thousands of ETFs available to invest in. ETF Prime has sorted through them all, so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the Quadratic Interest Rate Volatility and Inflation Hedge ETF. The ticker symbol is IVOL, I-B-O-L. And joining us to discuss this ETF is Nancy Davis, founder of Quadratic Capital. She's also the portfolio manager for this ETF. And prior to founding Quadratic, Nancy actually spent nearly 10 years at Goldman Sachs. So she rose to become the head of credit derivatives and uh, OTC trading there. She also previously managed a $500 million derivatives portfolio at Highbridge and served in a senior executive role at Alliance Bernstein. Nancy is now on the line with us from New York. Nancy, a pleasure having you on the show this week. Nate, thanks so much for having me on your podcast, ETF Prime. This is fabulous. So, Nancy, this ETF just launched in May. There's really nothing else out there that's like this. Let's just jump right in. Walk us through what this holds, what the investment process is, and and what the end investment goal is. Yeah, no, it's uh, very exciting to do something innovative in the ETF world. Um, IVOL is a first-of-its-kind ETF because we own inflation-protected bonds, plus we own OTC, so over-the-counter options, that are tied to the shape of the interest rate yield curve. So it's very different. It's not another um, short-duration or floating-rate note or MinVol uh, ETF. So we're excited about it. Okay, so what's the investment goal here? Yeah, so we give um, investors exposure to inflation-protected yield, number one. So it is a fixed-income ETF. It's designed to hedge an increase in fixed-income volatility. So when volatility increases, meaning there's market stress happening, IVOL is intended to appreciate under those circumstances because we own options. And when you buy an option, you're long volatility and you benefit from an increase in volatility. And we also profit from a steepening of the yield curve. And the yield curve, um, let me just define that, that's the difference between front-dated interest rates and long-dated interest rates. And it's a pretty exciting time because right now the yield curve, if you look at the Treasury yield curve, it's currently inverted. Um, Now, that typically happens before an equity risk-off period. So what that means is an investor is actually paid more yield right now to own a three-month T-bill than a 10-year Treasury. 
And that's pretty wild if you think about it. You get paid more interest, more yield to have a shorter duration asset. So we, we profit from a normalization of those, uh, that situation. So when the yield curve steepens, we also benefit from that. And that can happen either from the Fed cutting rates more in the front end, or it can happen from a normalization of the long end where interest rate yields go higher. So it's a good replacement for people who own uh, floating rate notes or bank debt or minval stocks or even just inflation-protected bonds. Nancy, taking a step back, we always like to make sure we cover the basics on ETF Prime. Do you mind briefly explaining how both inflation-protected bonds tips and then these options on the interest rate uh, swap curve work, just at a very high level? Yeah, so tips benefit from real yields moving lower. So what we mean by real yields, and that's what the Fed ultimately targets and central banks around the world ultimately target, is um, the difference between nominal yields, which is the actual level of interest rate, and real yields are less the inflation. So right now, the CPI market is around 1.82%. And the market, the rates market, is pricing deflation for the next decade. So that's a pretty asymmetric time, and you can see that with the inverted yield curve. Like, if you think about what that means, the market is pricing deflation. So under normal circumstances, an investor is paid more yield for a longer duration security. And IVAL is designed to profit from a normalization of inflation expectations by owning these options on the shape of the yield curve or a period of risk off where the Fed will cut rates in the front end and volatility typically increases during that market stress environment. Yeah, so Nancy, on that note, can you give us some sense as to the type of experience investors might expect with IVOL? What what, what does that risk return profile look like? And I guess maybe another way to frame this is, look, IVOL currently holds about 85% tips. So what does that additional 15% exposure to options provide on both the upside and the downside? Yeah, so there are two ways um, that the options can make money or lose money. Um, Two ways. Number one is an increase in fixed income volatility, specifically this is interest rate volatility, increases in vol we do well in. We're designed to profit from that because we own options. A decrease in volatility, we tend to lose money because we also own options. That goes, the implied vol goes into the price of the option. And we also have the steepening of the yield curve. So we're designed to profit from either cuts from the Fred in the front end or an increase in yields in the back end. So for investors who own floating, floating rate notes or bank debt or things that are tied to floating rate interest rates, this might be a better alternative so you don't have the credit exposure. This has no um, credit exposure. It's just sovereign bonds plus these options on the yield curve. Now, let's say the yield curve uh, remains flat, doesn't move at all. Um, Then I'm assuming the options would be a drag on returns at that point, correct? Um, Most of the time in a steeper yield curve, the options actually have positive carry. Right now with the inverted yield curve, the options are negative carry. But we also have the return from the bonds, so it's a lot easier to own from an asset allocation point of view, interest rate volatility, than other types of volatility, which is right now in the exchange-traded product world, investors really only have a choice of owning uh, equity vol. And that's the interesting thing. There are lots of different types of volatility. Every single asset class, whether it's commodities or FX or rates or credit or equities, they all have their own volatility markets. When we talk about volatility markets, we're talking about options. Nancy, this is Jason Lank. How far out do you typically go from a time standpoint with the options in terms of roll? How often are you rolling these? Yeah, so in our prospectus, um, we guide investors to say the average tenor of option maturity in our portfolio will be anywhere from six months to two years. Um, Our holdings are fully disclosed on our website, too. So it's an active, transparent ETF, so you can see exactly what we hold every single day. And Nancy, just to be clear, you alluded to this earlier. Where does this ETF fit in an investor's portfolio? And I guess along with that, this is a more complex strategy. So who should own this ETF? 
Yeah, we're excited to do something really different in the ETF world and not another um, short duration or floating rate note product. Um, if you think about the interest rate market, it's the biggest market in the world, and there really isn't a product in the ETF world that's on interest rates. There's tons of products in the fixed income space that are credit spreads, right? So many things that trade, you know, credit and are, you know, have been benefiting from credit spreads tightening with equity markets rallying. But if you think about it, when equity markets sell off, typically credit spreads widen and typically bonds are bid. So this is a diversifier. So this is good for people who are worried about equity market sharks or recessions, an interest rate yield curve tends to steepen when we have long, ec- large equity drawdowns because the Fed will cut rates in the front end and vol will increase. Um, this is also great for investors who are worried about inflation with all the money printing going around globally that um, we have options on basically inflation expectations. So it's a tip plus the shape of the yield curve. Um, And that's very attractive because the market is pricing deflation for the next decade. Um, And you can see that by the yield curve being inverted. We also benefit from rising long-term interest rates that hurt bond prices. So many investors that have, you know, even if they have a shorter duration portfolio, when bond yields increase, prices of bonds go down, and so investors can lose principal. So it's a good hedge for a fixed income book or investors who have mortgages or real estate. And we also benefit from an increase in volatility. Nancy, we have just a couple of minutes left. I know you've been extremely vocal about helping democratize access to investment strategies, right? Providing investors more choices, access to institutional caliber strategies, I'm curious, why do you feel so strongly about this? Um, This is a fabulous product for multitude of situations, in my opinion. And most investors don't have access to market because it's not listed. It's over the counter. So you have to have an ISDA. Um, You have to have the ability to understand options and to be able to monitor that risk. So we really see Eyeball as an access vehicle to flatten the world of investing and give investors access to this product that is so important for their overall wealth of their portfolio. Because most regular people, the majority of their net worth is tied up in their home. Um, and that's uh, Ival is designed to benefit from when mortgage rates increase, which is long-dated yields, we're designed to profit from that. And it's a very attractive hedge for just regular people who own homes. Um, because typically when you have rising long-dated rates, um, you have a decrease in real estate prices. So we think it is very appropriate for regular investors' portfolios, and we're excited to do something new and provide access to something really different. And the interest rate markets are also the largest market in the world. Um, The uh, OTC rate markets have been estimated to be about $600 trillion dollars, whereas the U.S. equity market cap is about $23 trillion. So think about it. It's anywhere from 25 to 30 times bigger than U.S. equities. And as far as I'm aware, this is the first product that actually trades interest rate options and bonds. So it's very exciting to do something different and offer investors more choices. Well, Nancy, we are out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there. Congratulations on the ETF. Off to a good start, by the way. Last I checked, already more than $27 million invested in this ETF, which is fantastic, having launched only last month. Certainly wish you continued success. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thanks so much. That was Nancy Davis, founder of Quadratic Capital. The ETF is the Quadratic Interest Rate Volatility and Inflation Hedge ETF. And you can learn more about this ETF by visiting iVolETF.com. I want to thank our exclusive sponsor, Leg Mason. You can visit legmason.com to learn more about their broad range of investment strategies. Podcasts of ETF Prime are available at etfprime.com, etf.com, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. You can follow me on Twitter, at Nate Geraci. Next week, we'll be joined by Dave Mazza, head of product at Direction. We're going to look at a new suite of ETFs they rolled out earlier this year. They're called Relative Weight ETFs. Uh, And then Todd's 
Sorry, Todd Rosenbluth of CFRA is going to join us to cover a variety of uh, ETF topics. Always fun having Todd on the show. Until then, have a great week, everyone.